think you, um, just these two. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you much, very much, John, for that very nice introduction. It's been my great pleasure to my honor to work with John Percy for a number of years uh, through the Commission on Education and Development of the International Astronomical Union, and I look forward to continuing to, uh, to work with you. It's a pleasure for me to be back at the University of Toronto, and I'm pleased to be in this symposium. I was pleased to learn as much as I did this morning from interesting talks in the, uh, in the symposium. And some of the things that I will say uh, will tie together uh, some threads that we've already been hearing about today. I uh, started doing this work on the transit of Venus some 14 years ago when there was a play uh, near us in Berkshire County. My wife Naomi, who's here, noticed it in the theater uh, listings. It was called The Transit of Venus. I knew nothing about transits of Venus, but how could we not go to such a play? It turned out to be about Le Gentil, about whom I'll say something later, and the, the circumstances turned out to be uh, so interesting that not only did this play by the Canadian playwright Maureen Hunter uh, be very interesting, but it led Victor Davies, who's here with his wife Laurie Davies, to write an opera about it. The circumstances are so dramatic. So I will leave the drama of Le Gentil to, <laughs> to Victor, who's the next speaker, uh, but, but let me uh, try to put the transits of Venus in context and lead up to our own current research about the transit of Venus, and then, uh, and then at the end I'll tell you what we plan after this June 5th uh, transit of Venus. Uh, I did en en enroll my friend and colleague Glenn Schneider from the University of Arizona in a lot of the data reduction you're going to see when we do the scientific part, and uh, Leon Golub has built the telescopes that are on the spacecraft, first the transition region and coronal explorer that you'll see some observations from in 2004, and now there's a successor, Solar Dynamics Observatory, that we'll be using in June. And Bryce Babcock is my colleague at Williams College, with whom I've done a lot of expeditions, to mainly to eclipses, but also to, uh, uh, to transits. I like to start by talking about Copernicus. Uh, because I love Copernicus and, uh, and what he did. He was a great mathematician. He didn't just wake up one morning and say, oh yes, the sun is at the center. He really worked it out in detail. Uh, my wife and I went with Lee Robbins yesterday to the Magnificent Rare Book Library here to see a second edition of Copernicus's work from uh, 1566. Here's the, the uh, page from the, the title page from the first edition, uh, but uh, very Noticeably, uh, up in leaf 10, pretty far up here we see Sol and Mercury and Venus and the Earth with the Moon going around it. And you can see just from this diagram that it's only Venus and Mercury that can go between the Earth and the, uh, and the Moon. So uh, we are now talking about a transit of Venus, and I'll say some things towards the end about the last transit of Mercury as well. Perhaps my favorite astronomer, was Johannes Kepler, uh, who uh, was uh, somewhat overshadowed in the popular mind by Galileo. They were contemporaries. Uh, in 1596, uh, Kepler figured out a beautiful way of taking the, the regular solids, the five platonic solids, and fitting them together to explain the spacing of the planets in the solar system, using by the Copernican model. And he came up with this big fold-out plate um, in, in a book. Uh, the uh, Cosmographic uh, Mystery of 1596, and it's one of the most beautiful diagrams of all times, I think, in the history of science. It's entirely wrong, uh, uh, but, it is, uh, but it was inventive enough that when Tycho Brahe moved to, uh, moved to Prague, he did ask the young Kepler up to, uh, uh, to work with him, and Kepler uh, eventually got, uh, got Tycho's data. Just in case you think these things are happening long ago, uh, Tycho was disinterred a couple of years ago. His bones were taken to Aarhus University in Denmark for examination. They're supposed to be coming out with a documentary this, this spring about what they discovered about Tycho and the circumstances of his death and what they can find out uh, about him. That's been slightly delayed. They had promised it by, by now. 
Uh, in any case, if we go back to the book by Thomas Diggs from 1556, you see that they just didn't know what was going on at, uh, at that time. Uh, here's uh, Jupiter and the Sun, Earth and Mars about the same time, Venus very small. The, these were moving points of light in the sky, but they didn't know how big anything was, how far anything was away. Uh, and certainly what Thomas Diggs uh, did in 1556 was f uh, far from the modern view with uh, NASA images uh, pasted to the right scale of the, the giant sun. And these are the, the terrestrial planets. Jupiter is much bigger. Um, and uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, and, uh, and Mars, as we now know them from space. Kepler finally did get, uh, get Tycho's data. Uh, I'm not one of those who think that, that uh, uh, Kepler actually killed Tycho. <laughs> Uh, but, which is one of the stories that's been going around, and one of the things that will be the result of, of the autopsy that uh, hasn't yet been reported on, uh, on Tycho. But in any case, uh, Kepler got the data, and in 1609, he wrote about the new astronomy based on a celestial physics from the star Mars, uh, from the work of Tycho Brahe, and Rudolf paid for it. So Rudolf gets a lot of, of uh, credit in, in this. There's a new novel by Stuart Clark about the relations of, of all these people um, putting plausible conversations among them, putting them all in context. It took, in that book, he came up with his first two laws of orbits, as most of you know. The first, that the planets orbit the sun in ellipses with the sun at one focus, and the second, in the elliptical orbit, uh, going, uh, covering equal areas in equal times so as to explain why the planets uh, go more rapidly close to the sun. We see that now in comets, for example. Uh, and it took him another 10 years before he came up with the harmony of the world and, um, and came out with his third law that links the periods of the planets with their distances from the sun to the extent that the, the period square is proportional to the distance cubed. If he had the computing power that I had on my watch, just think what he could have done. <laughs> Uh, he worked this all out by hand. We looked at uh, one of his books again in the library uh, yesterday, and you see these, these huge long tables and pages and pages of tables, each of which he worked out by, uh, by hand. The um, historian of science and astronomer Owen Gingrich has reproduced some of his calculations, and he did make an occasional mistake and compensating mistakes that sometimes brought it back, but it was just a magnificent work. And then he went on in 1627, with even more credit to, uh, to Tycho, to work out tables that could be used to compute where things were and when, and when they were there. These were not ephemerides. They didn't say the Venus will be beautiful tonight the way, uh, the way I can tell you now, and which I hope you've all seen. Um, but it could be used to calculate uh, things at, the, uh, at that time. Here's the, the title page uh, honoring, honoring Rudolph. And the different columns are, uh, are beautiful to an extent of the uh, progress in, uh, in astronomy. Uh, Copernicus gets a better column than, than Ptolemy. Here's the Emperor Rudolph's eagle raining down money on the astronomers. <laughs> and so, uh, so here you can see Copernicus's column is, is better than Hipparchus's plane column, and uh, Tycho uh, really gets a good column uh, uh, over there. And, uh, and there's Tycho's island, Ven, in the coast off Denmark. And here's Kepler slaving away at his table doing the calculations uh, just, just below. In any case, in the Rodolphine tables, he had, he had uh, calculations for Venus. And, uh, and he had this for various years and times and things that had to be put together. And he figured out that there would likely be a transit of Venus and a transit of Mercury in the year 1631. Um, uh, and, and then he did die uh, going off to collect an old debt. He'd been in trouble. His mother was being tried as a witch, and he was defending her. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on. But in any case, he predicted in 1631, there'd be a transit of Venus, but we, we know it would only be visible in what we now call the United States and Canada, and they didn't have any telescopes there in 1631. The transit of Mercury was, in fact, seen by the French astronomer Cassandi in Europe, 
And so that was some backing for Kepler. Uh, and even more than that, was therefore backing for Copernicus, which was still uh, controversial at the, uh, at the time. Uh, but then Kepler was dead, and there weren't predictions in the future. And um, I have to coordinate what I'm seeing here and, and, and what's there. So here are, here are uh, Kepler's tables from the Rudolphine tables for, for Venus. Uh, and then a young, uh, a young man, uh, in his early 20s, uh, who had been up at Cambridge, calculated with the tables that Kepler had missed predicting a transit of Venus in 1639. There'd be another transit only eight years after the, the first one. And he wrote a couple of uh, people he had been in correspondence with. One was William Crabtree in Manchester. Uh, Horrocks was in Hull, not too far from Manchester, but they never did meet. And he wrote a friend in London. And they tried to, uh, to observe. The paintings were made a couple of hundred years later, so we don't actually know the, the circumstances. We know there was some kind of uh, projection. We know that somehow uh, Horrocks came back on a Sunday in the afternoon uh, from an unavoidable duty and found Venus already on the sun. We assume that he did something with the local church. He was too young to be a curate. People don't don't really know what, uh, what he was doing. And, uh, and he saw Venus in transit. It looked very, uh, very different in size from, uh, from what he expected. Uh, Crabtree, as I think was mentioned this morning, was so excited that, uh, that he didn't write anything down. Um, and in London, it was cloudy. So basically, Horrocks and Crabtree were the only two people in the world to see the 1639 transit of, uh, of Venus. His work wasn't published until 1662, when uh, Johannes Hevelius uh, came out with a book about a transit of Mercury uh, that had happened there. And as an appendix, he included the work of Horrocks in the, uh, in the transit of Venus. And here is, therefore, Horrocks' drawing, as published by Hevelius uh, a few decades later. And you can see how small Venus is compared uh, to the Sun. And we see the size of the sun, we see the, the angle of the ecliptic, and there are various other calculations that are there. We think we know where he observed from Carr House in what's now called Much Hool, and uh, a colleague, Kevin Clyburn, from the Manchester Astronomical Society, an amateur society in Manchester, went to look out that window a couple of months ago to see if in the late afternoon you could actually see, um, see the sun uh, at the angle. Uh, and it's, it's marginal. Uh, it's not clear whether there might have been some variations to the, um, to the windows uh, in reconstruction over the hundreds of years. But this is where, supposedly, uh, Horrocks uh, saw the, uh, the transit of Venus in 1639. So we now know that there are these transits every, uh, when pairs separated by eight years, and then a gap of 121 and a half years, and then a gap, and then eight years, and then a gap of 105 and a half years, uh, et cetera. So um, we're going to talk now about some of these, uh, some of these transits. They happen periodically only because uh, the orbit of Venus is inclined to the orbit of the Earth. Uh, by three plus degrees, and so only at these nodes, when the, the two planes cross, uh, can we have uh, a lineup of Venus and the Sun. This drawing was just done for an article that is uh, being published on May 1st, which is in a couple of days, I guess, a few days, uh, in the journal Physics World. It will be available uh, online, uh, but I wish that I had had uh, um, the diagram, the beautiful diagram we saw this morning, a hand-drawn diagram would have been much better, much better than this, so I told them. Uh, anyway, the key point is then in 1716, um, Edmund Halley uh, calculated that if you could time the transits the, by, uh, to about a second of time, which was barely possible to do with their clocks at, the, uh, at that time, uh, and you could look from as far north and as far south on the Earth. We've heard that. We've seen some map uh, already today. Um, then you could compute the distance to the uh, sun by triangulation. 
And then the key point then is that Kepler's laws were proportional. The third law linked the period square and the distance cube. And once you had any one distance, you had all the distances. So it's not just finding the distance of the sun. It's finding all the distances among everything in the, uh, in the solar system. Um, so uh, this was called uh, by a later astronomer royal the, noble, uh, the noblest problem in, uh, in astronomy. And we heard before about Delisle's uh, alternate ideas of, of accurate timing. Uh, instead, uh, but Halley needed both, uh, both times, beginning and ends of the transits, because there's a chord across the sun. And if you can time it, you can uh, get to see where on the curvature of the sun the, uh, your chord falls. And if you're looking from different angles, the chords will be different lengths, and you, then you have a long triangle in which you can triangulate. But as was discovered in 1761, and here's an observation by Tobin Bergman in Scandinavia, that this black drop effect that we heard mentioned this morning appeared linking the silhouette of Venus with the sky outside. And this black drop uh, pulled and enlarged for about a minute. And therefore, the accuracy of the timing was close to 60 times worse than was needed for the accuracy desired to use Halley's method. So the black drop effect is what bedeviled the transit of Venus, and through that, the distance to the sun, and through that, all the distances in the solar system, and uh, remained an important problem for hundreds of years. Uh, and uh, to uh, try to get around. Now, recently, I've uh, done a little work with uh, Will, William Sheehan, an independent uh, historian of science, uh, about some reports by the Russian famous scientist Mikhail Lomonosov, who reported that in his observations of 1761, uh, from St. Petersburg, he saw Venus's atmosphere. And he is just about universally credited in all the books with discovering Venus's atmosphere. Uh, and we have actually concluded that he didn't actually see Venus's atmosphere because, as I'll show you in a little bit, we now know what Venus's atmosphere looks like at a transit from the modern observations. And what he reported was just very, uh, was just very different. He reported, and this is his diagram, a blister on the side of, uh, of Venus. And, um, and we think that's an effect akin to the black drop effect. Not exactly that, but related to the things that go into the black drop effect. And he reported seeing a flash of light of a, that lasted about a second. And as I'll show you a little later, we see the atmosphere of Venus for about 20 minutes. So we think that uh, what he was seeing was something different, possibly the end of the black drop effect when the distance just appeared between the two. And we have an article coming out in the uh, Journal of Astronomical History and, uh, and Heritage in, the, in this next issue about, uh, about that. Uh, so here, here's the, uh, the article that's, uh, uh, that's, that's going to come out. In any case, he wasn't the only one who observed in 1761. There were hundreds of expeditions that went all over the world with uh, um, not only science, but international prestige. For making, these, uh, for making these observations and going to remote areas as far north and as far south as possible. Uh, one of the major expeditions was done by the Abbe Shap Donawash, whose name was also mentioned today, who went into Siberia. Uh, Shap actually hated everything about Russia and everything about Siberia. Uh, and wrote a book, Voyage to Siberia, that was so obnoxious that Catherine the Great herself wrote a rebuttal. <laughs> Uh, there is a current historian of science who's done uh, published a paper about 10 years ago that actually Schapp may have, have uh, been not quite a spy, but sending back information to the king of France uh, in going across Siberia. So there may have been multiple reasons for him to do this investigation. But in any case, he did, uh, he did go to, uh, uh, to Siberia and got some observations uh, of the transit of 1761. And then he went to Baja, California, to see the transit of Venus in, uh, in, 17, uh, in 1769. Uh, and when he got to the place where he was going to observe a few days before the transit, after months of travel, they said, do not stop here. There is illness here. And he said, well, I've got to stop here. I don't really have time to go somewhere else and set up in time. 
So an epidemic, distemper, raged at San Jovis, had already swept away a third of the inhabitants when Mr. Schapp came thither. They might have escaped the contagion by going on to Cap San Lucas, which is actually the best place, as it turned out, to observe the eclipse in 1991. Um, and this was what the Spanish officers proposed, but they were in a few days of the transit, and, uh, and they didn't do it. So on the 5th of June, two days after they'd observed the transit of Venus, Mr. Doe, Mr. Medina, and all the Spaniards belonging to them, the number of 11, sickened at once. This occasioned a general consternation, the groan of dying men, the terror of those who were seized with the distemper, all conspired to, to make the village of St. Joseph a scene of horror. Uh, but they did observe the, uh, the transit of Venus there. And, uh, and in, in any case, um, uh, they did see the transit of Venus. He, he did sicken. Most of them died. Uh, he did say, there's an eclipse of the moon coming in a couple of months. I want to survive to see that. And he did survive about two more months. And, uh, and then, uh, as they say, the intent of his voyage was fulfilled. He saw the transit of Venus. He had the bonus of the eclipse of the moon, and he saw nothing more to wish for, and he died content. So that is true dedication. I don't know if it's a second opera or not. <laughs> um, uh, in, any, uh, in any case, um, we, uh, we did uh, have uh, Shap, uh, we did have uh, Guillaume Le Gentil, and I'm going to leave that for Victor to, to, uh, uh, to talk about, uh, who went in France in, uh, in 1761 to Pondicherry, India, where he was prevented from landing by the British having taken Pondicherry. His clock, his pendulum clock, couldn't give accurate time from the ship from which he watched in clear skies, so he stayed. Uh, he decided to stay. It was only another eight years. And um, so he stayed for the second transit of the pair. And he went to the Philippines. He, he came back, uh, set up his, uh, his instruments. And um, uh, the day came, and it was clear. And they were observing, and they were ready. And then a cloud came in front of the sun. And so he missed the second time. And, uh, and then he was shipwrecked, and he got dysentery, et cetera, and got home three years later to find himself declared dead and his goods given away. Uh, so this is the stuff of opera, and you'll hear uh, Victor Davies uh, talk after me uh, about that. Let me instead uh, talk about Captain Cook, a young lieutenant who was given a ship by the British Admiralty, which is why we call him Captain Cook, um, and, and went to, the, uh, uh, to see the transit of Venus in Tahiti. This is a statue of Captain Cook in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, the, day was, uh, the day was very clear. And we have his uh, handwritten journals. And, uh, and uh, Carol Percy, the daughter of John uh, and, uh, and Myra Percy, is an expert on the journals of, uh, of Captain Cook uh, and the language in them. And uh, in any case, uh, Cook had with him an astronomer who had been trained at Greenwich, uh, Charles Green. Uh, and, uh, and they did observe, they had very clear observing weather, not a cloud in the sky, they said. Uh, and they did observe the, the black drop effect and these, these effects of Venus going into the sun but being separated from the outside. They mistakenly thought that that was the atmosphere of Venus, and, and they wrote that in the uh, report, in the, in, the, uh, in the journal, and eventually in the Royal Society's uh, Philosophical Transactions. That was Green's drawing. These are, uh, these are Cook's uh, drawings here. And then also you see there's this shading around, which we now know is uh, a lens, an optical effect. You saw that on the, the uh, poster for the, for the meeting also. Um, and is, is not the atmosphere. The atmosphere is much, much thinner uh, than, uh, than that. In any case, Cook had secret orders that he could open once the transit was over. And they said, go and explore the southern continent. And we now know that that led to what his exploration of what we call New Zealand and the uh, east coast of Australia. And incidentally, this is where we're going to be for the uh, eclipse of the sun in, uh, in November. And then the following uh, May, there's an annual eclipse of the sun that will come across, uh, across like this. But uh, Captain Cook was there first. So that's what I'm going to say about the 18th century transits. 
We then go into the 19th century transits that we heard uh, uh, something about. The government astronomer in Australia has a much better reputation, uh, to me anyway, now after having heard the talk from this morning, than the government astronomer in, uh, in England, uh, the, Royal Astron the Astronomer Royal uh, in England. And Henry Chamberlain Russell put together this wonderful book of uh, drawings from many people of the eclipse in 1874. Uh, and you can see the black drop effect. And you can also see that when Venus was partway on, you could see some light around this trailing limb of Venus. And that we actually think is the, uh, what we know is actually Venus's uh, atmosphere. And, and here's Venus going across the surface of the sun. There were many American expeditions that went in 1882. Mariah Mitchell had discovered a comet and won the King of Denmark's gold medal, became a professor at Vassar College. The Naval Observatory uh, sent uh, several expeditions around. They had a, a graded plates over the film so they could measure better uh, what, was, uh, what was going on. And, uh, and Bill Sheehan and others have put together some animation of the Lick Observatory plates uh, of this, uh, of this uh, transit. Uh, so, uh, so we do have the, the astronomer David Todd from Amherst went out to, to Mount Wilson, to, to Mount Hamilton in California for this 1882, uh, for this 1882 transit. John Philip Sousa wrote a march, a truly horrible piece of music. <laughs> the Transit of Venus March. A little repetitive, I like but he also wrote, but he also wrote a, a novel, *The Transit of Venus*, which was actually truly the worst novel I have ever read. So, uh, so as a, as a musician, and um, let's see, and uh, have these, this other half now. Um, So actually, um, that's the end, not the beginning of that one. So I want to move now to more modern, uh, to more modern times. And I got interested then, having heard about the transit of Venus from Maureen Hunter's play, uh, by going to a historical astronomy division uh, talk by Brad Schaefer in a meeting of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, and, uh, and he uh, talked about the notorious black drop effect and the fact that more than half the articles and books that were being published gave an incorrect explanation for the black drop effect, attributing it to Venus's atmosphere, which it was not. And I realized that, uh, that I knew how to look at the sun or how to get the data from looking at the sun from spacecraft. Uh, and I could potentially uh, work on this problem. I uh, brought in Glenn Schneider uh, uh, with me uh, to try to see what the real explanation was and, uh, and why all these books were still explaining things wrongly. Now, we didn't have data in, uh, in the year 2000, 2001, from a transit of Venus. Nobody alive on Earth had seen a transit of, uh, of Venus. Uh, and uh, there were these, these old photographic records. Uh, but in any case, Mercury does go in transit across the face of the sun about 15 times a century and had gone in transit in 1999. And we were able to get observations from NASA's Transition Region and Coronal Explorer, known as TRACE, uh, from the 1999 transit of Mercury. These are isophotal uh, contours, equal intensity contours. And you can see that we have Mercury inside the surface of the sun without being cleanly separated from the, uh, from the outside of the sun. This is, uh, and this is a black drop effect. So we could see that you could have a black drop effect without an atmosphere, because Mercury has no atmosphere. And we were observing from outside uh, the Earth's atmosphere. 
So, uh, so we were looking forward to this uh, 2004 transit of uh, Venus to see whether we could uh, deconvolve the observations of the transit of Venus the way we had done with the transit of Mercury. Uh, in the meantime, we had a series of observations of the transit of Mercury. Here's from the Big Bear Solar Observatory. It was, as you see, a grazing, uh, a grazing transit. And if you look at the sun through different filters, you're looking at different levels of the atmosphere. So the sun is, uh, is different sizes. And that's actually one of the things we want to do with Venus um, next month is measure the transit of Venus in several different filters and see what we can say about the sizes of Venus's atmosphere. The uh, Tray spacecraft uh, looked, uh, uh, look, looked in several different uh, bands here. Let's see. Um, let's make this play here. It was playing before. Somehow, th somehow this is not playing. I have a still of it also. Let me, I'm sorry that one isn't playing. Let me, let me just try that again. Because this first one played. So here's the white light observation. And you, and you can barely see it doesn't completely cleanly separate. Well, I'm sorry this one, this one isn't, uh, isn't playing right. But in any case, uh, we, I do have these stills showing that if you look uh, more in a continuum, you can see that the sun is a little lower and, and, uh, and Mercury is a little higher. And if you look at the white light view here, you can see a black drop effect uh, here for the transit of Mercury, which again, I stress, has no atmosphere. And here's a series of observations of uh, the transit of, uh, of Mercury. And you can see the black drop very clearly in a whole series of, uh, of frames there. So we tried to figure out just what was going into that, uh, into that uh, black drop. You can take an individual image and you can make uh, isophotal maps of the, uh, of the image. And it turns out that some of that is from the inherent blurring of the, the telescope, given the finite size of the telescope. We call that a point spread function, because if you have a point, namely a star, its image is spread out a little bit. But that only accounts for a fraction of the effect. A major part of the effect that hadn't been properly realized is the solar limb darkening. Now, the sun gets darker near the edge. You can see that clearly on the, on the pictures of the transit of, of Venus. We'll come back to that. And it turns out that it goes, gets so severely dark in just that, that arc second or so at the edge of the sun, uh, where you see the black drop effect, uh, that, that you have this extreme, extremely dark sun. Remember, the sun is a ball. It doesn't have a sharp edge. Uh, the, it, we're looking through uh, opaque gas at different angles. And at some point, it's, it's so, uh, so opaque that you can't see through it. And not too far away, it's not so opaque. And in between, uh, you get some opacity that, uh, that you can measure. And that turns out to be a major contributor to the black drop effect. So it was a great pleasure and interest to us to be able to fully explain this problem that had been going on for a long time. Because only when we took away both the effect of the point spread function and of the limb darkening, could we see Venus cleanly inside the sun, uh, having completely removed the black drop effect. This, uh, this transit was observed, I should say 2004, uh, with various telescopes, including this uh, new Swedish uh, solar telescope in the, in the Canary Islands. And the TRACE spacecraft is in polar orbit. So, all by itself, it did what Halley wanted done, observing from very far north and very far south. And, and so you can actually see the images uh, over, the, uh, over time as, as the Trace spacecraft observed on the, uh, on the sun. So from this frame alone, we could compute the distance from the Earth to the sun. Uh, this was the transit of Mercury. Oh, no, I'm, so I'm, I'm wrong. This was, this was this is back in Mercury. So this was 2003. So this was the next, there was a transit of Mercury in 1999. This is correctly labeled 2003. That was the transit of Mercury. And then this is the trace observation of the transit of Mercury of 2003. And then we're coming up to the transit of Venus in 2004. 
So needless to say, I wanted to see the black drop effect from my own eye. And I wanted to double the chance of seeing it. So I wanted to go to a place where I could see two black drops. And the transit was in progress in sun at sunrise here. So I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be somewhere in the zone in which one could see the whole transit. And so I went uh, with my students and colleagues to, uh, to Greece. We just wanted to choose a, a place. And, and they had a 20 centimeter big refracting telescope. And we brought other telescopes and cameras uh, to observe the this uh, by ourselves, and I was especially interested in the black drop. And at the same time, we had li liaisons with the Trace spacecraft, and we got them. And for one thing, the Trace spacecraft could only look at part of the sun at a time, and we wanted to make sure they were looking at the right part of the sun to see Venus, and we wanted them to jack up the speed at which they were taking observations so we could watch the black drop uh, form. And so we were working on that, but we were observing from the ground. Uh, in the meantime, uh, colleague Bruce Elmagreen from IBM uh, was at a meeting in South Africa and, uh, and had these, uh, these medals uh, made. Everybody in the meeting got one in silver. And uh, there were a few made in gold. And I learned last week that this is now available for $50,000 on eBay. <laughs> so don't all run out at one time. That's, uh, but uh, it is, at last I heard a couple of days ago, it was, st was still available. Uh, in any case, I went with Bryce Babcock, a colleague in Williamstown, observed with our students and telescope there. And we basically took all the uh, astrophysics majors of that year to work with us um, and, some, and some alumni. And we worked especially with Professor John Siridakis, uh, whose telescope it is at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. So here's one of the pictures we took. This is just with a telephoto lens on a Nikon on a tripod. You can very clearly see uh, Venus. Uh, in transit across the face of the sun. It takes about, it takes about six hours. Um, we, uh, you can very clearly see, well, first of all, you can see there are no sunspots, or essentially none. Uh, and you can also very clearly see the solar, the solar limb darkening. We did have a visitor, Victor. Uh, Philip Glass was there, uh, with, uh, first performance of his Orion that night. And so he came up and observed with us. Uh, the, uh, at the at the transit there, so you're not the only composer who's uh, interested in uh, in transits. I think everybody should be interested in uh, in in transits. And uh, so we were able to find out that the transition region of the Coronal Explorer um, did get very good observations. And when we looked at the observations, we were flabbergasted because before the black drop, we could see first contact when Venus first hit the surface of the sun. And then second contact would be all the way in. But about 20 minutes before second contact, we began to see Venus's atmosphere visible, very clearly visible. And you can also see that it's asymmetric. And we could orient that with the pole of, uh, of Venus. And we could see the different levels of Venus's atmosphere. And so we are now more interested, the black drop problem is solved, we're more interested in Venus's atmosphere and what we can do with the science of Venus's atmosphere and how the transit observations can work with the current spacecraft and other observations uh, to, uh, uh, to explain uh, Venus's atmosphere. Uh, so here again, you see uh, the atmosphere. It does get brighter as you go in. And so we, uh, we brought in uh, uh, Thomas Wiedemann from the observatory in Paris and Paolo Tanga from the observatory in Nice who are working with the Venus Express spacecraft and other Venus ob atmospheric uh, observations to explain what's going on there. We have a paper published about that. And then there was just the smallest bit of black drop uh, effect, again, as seen from this excellent telescope uh, up in a, in a spacecraft. So let's see if we can make this movie play. Hmm. Here we go. So uh, we have enlarged the, the brightness uh, by a factor of about eight outside, uh, outside the limb. But you can clearly see the atmosphere of Venus appear for about 20 minutes, which is a lot longer than Lomonosov supposedly one second. So we now know what it looks like for the transit of Venus to appear in, uh, in refraction there. 
So here's ingress, getting brighter, and, and, uh, and then here's egress. And you notice we speeded up the cadence, which means that it slows down for that uh, crucial uh, part of the black drop, which is what we were mainly programming the, uh, the spacecraft to, uh, uh, to do. And you can see the atmosphere form and then, and then disappear asymmetrically there. So we're really very pleased with those, uh, with those observations. Now you'll notice that the sun stayed steady in this observation. Uh, we, we did try to, uh, to, to have a, the movie also um, tracking on, let's see, uh, well, I don't know. This is my own computer, so I, I don't have a real excuse. So the movie's not playing. They did play a few days ago. Uh, well, anyway, um, again, you see a tiny black drop effect there, and you've seen the atmosphere appear in the, uh, in the videos. So we were also uh, working with a spacecraft, a NASA spacecraft called Akramsat, the active cavity radiometer irradiance measurement uh, run by uh, Richard Wilson for NASA. And, uh, and there, there's, a, there's kind of a hole in which the solar radiation goes, and the total solar radiation across the whole spectrum is, uh, is measured to a fraction of a percent. And we could actually see in, uh, in watts per square uh, meter and correct it to uh, one astronomical unit from, uh, from the sun, the uh, intensity of the sun. And we could see the, uh, the drop because of the transit of Venus. So we truly have an eclipse of the sun, except it's by Venus instead of the moon, and it covers a smaller area. It covers a tenth of a percent of the sun instead of 105 percent. Uh, of, the, of the sun. The blue curve includes the effect of the limb darkening as the trace spacecraft, uh, well, as this, uh, as this uh, spacecraft uh, went around. And, and there are uh, some gaps because the spacecraft was in low Earth orbit and was hidden by the sun for, uh, for part of, of the orbit. So here's the trace spacecraft going around, as you saw. And, uh, and, then, and then here's Akramsat going around. Uh, hidden behind the sun 40% uh, of the time. So those are the, those two spacecraft there that we, uh, that we were using. So, so uh, here again is the uh, measurement uh, versus the theory, the drop of a tenth of a percent uh, corresponding to the area of the sun that was covered by, uh, by Venus. And, but we could see the effect of the limb darkening and the entrance of uh, Venus into the sun. Now, this is just the technique that's being used by NASA's Kepler mission, uh, which, as many of you know, is looking at an area in the sky that has 150,000 stars in it and continually looks at these 150,000 stars. And it has found uh, some signs, and these are now simulations from the, from the light curves, from the graph of, uh, of intensity versus time, that there are a number of these, what they call exoplanet candidates, um, around these distant stars. And the current status is that there are 61 exoplanets and 2,300 plus exoplanet candidates. And they're sure that maybe 80% of those exoplanet candidates are real exoplanets, but they're just not sure which 80%. And there are a number of other factors, uh, such as fluctuations of the star brightness, of uh, star spots, the equivalent of sunspots, and maybe some other effects uh, that, uh, that can be confusing these exoplanet candidates with, uh, with exoplanets, but nonetheless have those dips in intensity attributable to other things. So part of our point is by looking at something that we know about in detail, namely a transit of Venus across the face of the sun, uh, we can see all kinds of strange effects that may uh, be confused in another context when you don't know exactly what's going on with the passage of a planet in front of the sun. So I feel a responsibility to, uh, to providing this, these data, this close look of the transit of Venus in 2004 and coming in 2012, 
Uh, and also, I feel a responsibility to the astronomers who are going to be looking at the transit of 2117. And when they look back at us in 2012 with our primitive instruments and our primitive theoretical ideas, uh, we want them to say, well, they did the best they could for, <laughs> for, that, for that time. And so I feel strongly that we want to do as many things as possible, uh, even when we're not entirely sure why we're collecting these data, uh, to observe this transit in, in all possible ways with all, all kinds of telescopes and, and, and all methods of data recording. Now, the method of Halley does work. The uh, French organizations, um, based at the Observatory of Paris, there's a, a computing calculating institute there, and together with the European Southern Observatory and European Education Organization, uh, had uh, amateur groups and schools, students, time the transit in various places to use Halley's method. Most of them were in Europe. It was centered in Europe, but they had some people all over uh, uh, here, not so, not so many in, uh, uh, in Australia or Asia uh, or, uh, or, or Canada or the United States. Uh, but nonetheless, they did do this experiment by the Halley method in 2004. Uh, they do intend to do it again. And at the Institut des Mécaniques Célestes et de Calcul des Ephemerides in Paris, they calculated the uh, AU to an uncertainty of only 11,000 kilometers, uh, very, very close to the, uh, to the true value within the, the standard error of the, uh, of the true value. So, so it's a nice verification, uh, and it's a very nice experiment, and a nice education experiment to involve students in, uh, in doing this, uh, this work. Uh, at the moment, there's a group based at NASA has got its Space Flight Center, run by uh, Lumeo and Elaine Lewis, uh, in, in trying to get a lot of publication, public education uh, going uh, for the transit of, uh, of Venus. Uh, a fellow named Stephen Van Root in Holland has, has worked out, in particular, an, an iPhone app. So you, you should be able to, when you go to transitofvenus.nl, download this app, and you can press the button at the beginning of the transit and press the button at the end of the transit, and they will be ready to pretty quickly provide you the distance from the Earth to the Sun. <laughs> Just think what Le Gentil could have done. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, you can link to these at a site that I run at, uh, at uh, well, eclipses.info. We have a subsidiary site with all our eclipse work, and that will also lead you to this site that we run at transitofvenus.info, which is a nice, easy URL to, uh, to remember, and you can go from that to these very other sites. So here we're coming up to the, to the 2012 uh, transit of Venus, and again, we're in progress uh, here, um, and so I would like to be in this white zone, uh, and that takes us to the Pacific. Now we have a new um, map maker, I mentioned him before, Michael Zeiler, a professional map maker who's turned his attention to making eclipse and transit maps. And there's all this various information about what the transit will look like and the times. This is, these are geocentric times. And, uh, and here's the, the center of the, uh, of the transit. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I will be in, in Hawaii there. Uh, and Michael has produced these maps at the, at the uh, beginning of the transit, the middle of the transit, and the end of the transit, geocentric. And these are the sites here that I've arranged for, uh, for observations. So I will be at the Mies Solar Observatory um, in, at the, uh, of the University of Hawaii on the island of Maui at an altitude of 10,000 feet. And then we have uh, colleagues observing at the Big Bear Solar Observatory in California, the Kitt Peak Observatory, and at the Sacramento Peak Observatory, one of my former students has time, or we, we together have time, but he'll be there with the giant Dunn Solar Tower, uh, which makes a beautiful image of the sun. The whole central portion, several tons, is evacuated so as to eliminate uh, solar turbulence in the, in the airflow. And there's a big spectrograph in which we are trying to study the atmosphere of uh, Venus. Uh, we just bought a new carbon dioxide filter for $5,000 because the solar filters they have there don't include one of the carbon dioxide uh, wavelength. Um, 
But at greatest transit, these sites on the uh, North American mainland will be just setting and, uh, and won't be there for third contact and fourth contact. And in fact, it'll be only a few degrees above the horizon, even from Hawaii, uh, though we hope we can see it. You can often see the sun down into the horizon uh, from then. We have been working with several spacecraft. The Solar Dynamics Observatory, I mentioned, will, uh, has pixels the same size as Trace, but more filters, and we can run it faster. And we've been working with them to, to, uh, to work on the plans for those ob that observing. Uh, this, this is part of what's called the HOP, the Hinode uh, Observation Program. Hinode is a Japanese spacecraft with American cameras on it. And this is what the transit of Venus will be like, and we have a plan uh, to uh, have Hinode observe, and Hinode has pixels that are less than half the size of the pixels on Solar Dynamics Observatory, so we hope for very high resolutions from, uh, uh, from space. Uh, I have been fortunate to have support from the Committee for Research and Exploration of the uh, National Geographic Society. We've had some additional funding from, uh, from Sigma Xi. So uh, let me go on with, with some concluding remarks. Um, we, uh, you have seen this list of transits that we are uh, observing and planning to observe. And, if, and, uh, and then we can look forward to somebody observing the transits for December 11, 2117, December 8, 2125. So I encourage those of you with young children to take them out and photograph them next to a projection of the transit of Venus on, uh, on June 5th so that when they are uh, 105 years old or 110 years old, which is entirely possible with advances in modern medicine, for some group of, the, uh, of them, they will have a picture like that. I did take my, uh, my daughter, now in her 30s, out to see uh, the, uh, Halley's Comet with the Halley Twice Club, the people in the old folks home who had seen the 1910 transit of Venus for just that purpose. So that's a fun thing you can do. If you do want to wait for simultaneous transits of Mercury and Venus, you'd have to wait a little longer. <laughs> But there are other transits you can see. So there, there, the transit of uh, Mercury in 2006 uh, was visible also in that uh, Hawaii Pacific zone. Uh, and I went there with my student, Saranja Tilakarwadani, and with Naomi and Glenn Schneider. Um, and uh, it was early in the morning. There were 60 mile an hour winds. We couldn't open the dome for a couple of hours. We're worried about that this year, though it's an afternoon uh, uh, transit. Uh, transit then. Eventually we could, uh, we could open the dome. Mercury is a lot smaller than Venus. It's actually one-thirtieth the uh, area of Venus is projected from the Earth, smaller than the sunspot. Um, and uh, so instead of a tenth of a percent uh, drop in the intensity, it's a, third of, a thirtieth of that, which makes it a third of a hundredth of a percent. Uh, so, but we did what we could uh, to, uh, to observe it. So here's Mercury looking even less substantial than, uh, than Venus. Um, uh, we do have a, a black drop effect uh, image. Um, actually, I forgot about this, uh, this image. Uh, I'm having a comment in Nature on the May 17th issue, and they wanted a black drop image, and I should offer them this one. But by image processing of Mercury uh, silhouetted against the sun, uh, from the Sacramento Peak Observatory, we have these wonderful observations of the transit of, uh, of, uh, of Mercury, and we can do all kinds of image processing to improve the resolution of these, uh, of these images now. And you can use that for calibrating the quality of the uh, spacecraft, of, of, well, of the spacecraft or of the ground-based observatory, because we know that it's a sharp edge for Mercury, and we can measure against the solar, uh, the solar features. Uh, we do have some observations from the source, NASA source spacecraft with uh, uh, Greg Kopp uh, about the uh, irradiance measurement uh, again. And this is Mercury, and you see we're not picking it up, it's certainly not definitively there. So we could measure the tenth of a percent from the transit of Venus, but not the third of a hundredth of a percent from, uh, from Mercury. But Hinode did, uh, did observe, and we should again have Hinode observations. So uh, finally, 
uh, we just haven't given up on transits because I discovered that, uh, that David Ehrenreich and Alfred Vidal-Majar in France have time on the Hubble Space Telescope to observe this transit of Venus, but Hubble can't point to the sun, as you may well know. It would be zapped in an instant. So they're going to look at the moon. Now, Glenn Schneider and a colleague did try to do this in 2004 under less than ideal conditions, but with Hubble, the conditions are pretty ideal, uh, and they did a test observation in January that worked very well, and they want to detect a tenth of a percent drop in the, re in the light reflected from the moon uh, over the period of the transit, which takes place about a half hour later from, uh, from the moon than it, than it will be from the Earth. And then I started asking, well, if they can do that on the moon, what else can we do? There's actually a transit of Venus as seen from Jupiter coming on September 20th, and that won't happen again until after Hubble's lifetime. So we've teamed up with my, my team of Schneider and Reardon and Babcock and the French team of Aaron Reich and Vidal Majar, and we have applied to the Hubble Space Telescope. And let me tell you, you don't want to spend time doing a proposal for the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they only accept about a seventh of the proposals. We certainly don't know if we're going to get time, but we have applied. We won't hear it to the middle of June. Uh, and if we do get that time, we would also apply to see a transit of Earth as seen from Jupiter, which would really be particularly interesting in terms of what you can see of, of Earth's atmosphere. And again, there won't be another one of those in the lifetime of, of Hubble. And then, if you ask about Saturn, there is a spacecraft on Saturn now, the Cassini spacecraft, going around Saturn, and that has an instrument that actually can look at the sun, and we actually have convinced them to observe for us the uh, transit, we weren't in time for May 6th, but the transit of December 21st uh, will be observed from the Cassini spacecraft, um, and the spacecraft is, is, uh, uh, is working very well. And uh, there are some other possibilities that are, that are going to be pretty far uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So we do have time for, uh, for, for Cassini there. So what we are doing, uh, so we are uh, applying for time on Venus, and, uh, and we should be notified about June 15th in that, and then we would try for the transit of Earth. If you are able to do all these other uh, transits, you do have time between now and the next transit of Venus from Earth in 2017. You have a few different possibilities, but those are really for telescopes in the future. And then I'll just leave you with uh, uh, the ability to calculate how long transits of Venus are for your place. There are a few people who've actually calculated for different uh, locations. Um, uh, we can tell you just what time things are, and in fact, if you go to this uh, tiny URL, dot com GM 2012 TOV, Xavier Jubier, and uh, uh, if I were to click on this, but we're running a little late, um, a map would come up and you can click where you are on the map and it shows you all your observing circumstances, which I happen to have printed out for Toronto. Um, and so on June 6th here, um, you actually see that the times uh, in, uh, in Toronto for some 17 minutes between first and second contact, and I really would like to know whether your telescopes that we just looked at can see the, the atmosphere of Venus uh, in that time. Uh, and then you have a couple of hours and a half before, uh, before sunset, uh, though that will be before halfway, uh, before halfway across. So there's a, still a lot going on. There's this wonderful transit coming up in a month or so, but there are other transits to be thought of thereafter. There's a transit of Mercury in, in 2016. There's lots of interesting work to do. I'm glad you all came to uh, participate in this transit of Venus symposium today. I've been glad to hear what I did this morning. I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks this afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me.